old mommy, old kitty. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, well, Shalom, thank you all for joining us here tonight to learn about how food affects your mind and body. For those who don't already know me, my name is Ali Wiener Avraham. I am the Jewish Education and Early Childhood Education Coordinator at the JCC of the Lehigh Valley in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I myself am a parent of two young children and wear plenty of hats in our community as a teacher, educator, and support for our teachers and parents within our community. For tonight's class, Hi. we have some amazing speakers, Dr. Kimberly Brown and Catherine Hi. Carter. Um, Catherine, would you mind um, introducing yourself? Sure, my name is Catherine. I am an inpatient pediatric dietitian with Sodexo for Lehigh Valley Riley Children's Hospital. And we have uh, Dr. Brown here as well. <laughs> Dr. Brown, can you introduce yourself? I certainly can. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting uh, me to join you this evening. Um, I am medical director of population health for Lehigh Valley Riley Children's Hospital and a longtime uh, pediatrician at Valley Health Partners Children's Clinic, which is at the 17th Street Hospital site. Looking forward to a good discussion this evening. Me too. I am really excited to <laughs> learn from you guys tonight. Okay, I know that you've got some great stuff lined up for us, so take it away. Okay, terrific. So uh, I believe I, I will start. Um, we uh, are aware that there may be a number of questions for us this evening, so we're really going to keep the presentation uh, short and allow for uh, time for discussion at the end. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start out with some uh, basic nutrition information, particularly for very young children, and uh, uh, we'll move on from there. So starting, you know, with newborns and infants, uh, breastfeeding, of course, is um, our number one choice for nutrition. And uh, I did include some information here. Uh, about you know, the frequency that we should be aiming for for breastfeeding and uh, signs that we are providing adequate nutrition uh, so that the baby is gaining weight and growing normally. Um, I do uh, want to point out that uh, while breast milk is of course the best nutrition for our newborns and infants, um, there is a need for vitamin D uh, supplementation when you breastfeed. Uh, and in addition, we have to make sure that there is an additional source of iron in the diet um, by six months. And then next with formula feeding. So again, we just provided uh, some very basic information about um, what sorts of formulas are available and um, how we prepare them, a little bit about the differences. Um, just as a note, we really uh, don't recommend soy formula unless there is a particular uh, indication for that uh, because of an underlying medical concern or uh, if a family is um, really wanting to follow more of a, a vegetarian sort of approach but is not um, breastfeeding. Uh, and then uh, some information about calorie needs. So lots of times parents will say, you know, how much should my baby be drinking? You know, and of course, when you're breastfeeding, we just, we let them uh, nurse uh, until they're full. Um, but then, you know, these are just some general ranges that we use for how much uh, babies are typically needing uh, in terms of formula or pumped breast milk, uh, and then their calorie needs per day for normal growth. Then we talk about uh, this lovely age of four to six months, one of my favorite ages. Um, these are, of course, your children who, when you smile at them, they cannot help 
but smile back at you. It's just an automatic response. And I love seeing these babies in the office because we have these beautiful interactions and we demonstrate how we have conversations at this very young age. Uh, so um, we recommend uh, breastfeeding uh, for the first six months. Um, by six months though, we do, that is when, as I mentioned, we do need that uh, supplemental iron uh, in the diet. And that um, usually comes in the form of infant cereal that's fortified with iron. So we are recommending it by six months of age to be uh, having them either on or starting that infant cereal twice a day. And then uh, gradually introducing fruits and vegetables, remembering to do that uh, one at a time uh, so that we make sure they're well tolerated. And um, for a baby who is developing normally, somewhere around six months of age is actually when I will start to do some finger feeding of soft pieces of fruit or uh, cooked vegetables. Um, and again, remembering that uh, vitamin D continues uh, for the breastfed baby. And we also start some supplemental fluoride if, um, you know, if the family's living in a location where there is not fluoride in the water. Uh, when I first started working uh, here in Allentown, there was not fluoride in the water, um, but for a long time now, we have had fluoride in the water in Allentown and Bethlehem had it from the time I moved here, so. Not an issue if you're living uh, in town. Okay. Um, again, as I mentioned, for older infants, we're definitely encouraging the finger feed, finger feeding of soft foods. And when we talk about that, I always say think soft and mushy. You know, little pieces of soft, mushy foods. And why is it important to do finger feeding? So at that age, when infants want to explore the environment uh, through, you know, their hands and their mouth. Um, they're ready to, to start the process of learning how to eat. And the great thing about finger feeding as opposed to spoon feeding is that infants have time, just like we need time when we're eating, to really um, appreciate the food that they're eating and to develop a sense of fullness, of satiety, and being able to say, you know, I'm done. Uh, and so it allows them to really appreciate the process of eating and start to recognize their own uh, body cues about being full. We do, of course, continue breastfeeding. Formula ends at a year, at which point we switch to whole milk and uh, no honey until after uh, the first year of age uh, due to the risk of uh, botulism. So this is just an example. You know, I'm sure you all have seen, you know, when you go to your pediatrician or family medicine uh, physician's office, they'll show you a picture of how the baby's growing. And um, this shows us that very often a decline in weight can be the first indication of, of you know, failing to thrive. And weight um, is the driver of other growth. So you see from this picture how weight falls off first uh, before length falls off. And um, last, and so the first growth curve affected, as we just said, of course, is weight. The second one would be a length or height. And the last to be affected, but still affected, if there is a prolonged period of inadequate uh, nutrient and calorie intake is head circumference, meaning um, brain growth. So, um, you know, malnutrition for an extended period of time definitely has a detrimental effect on uh, brain growth and uh, normal development. So again, I think we emphasize this um, pretty well. Uh, we're looking at a fall off in weight or a drop across those percentile lines that you saw on the charts above. And, um, <laughs> and uh, or uh, as, as we get older, either um, a weight for length or a BMI measurement that's less than the fifth percentile. So the most common etiology, as we talked about, is inadequate caloric intake. And so we always do a very careful feeding history uh, to get a sense about that and really see how, how the mother is doing, if, particularly if she's breastfeeding or whoever is the primary caretaker at home who's feeding the baby, because we want to make sure the person at home is, is doing okay, you know, is healthy themselves and is able to be normally responsive to the baby's needs. <clears throat> in addition, there are sometimes organic um, causes for um, failure to thrive. So 
that is a long differential, but we generally divide it into three different categories. Either they are not feeding enough calories, as we talked about already, or the baby is taking in enough calories, but has vomiting or diarrhea or some other reason that they are losing calories. So even then they may be retaining uh, breast milk formula foods, but still not gaining weight from that, meaning they're not really metabolizing it and getting the value from it, the caloric value. So some of those reasons, and again, it's a long list, but like chronic urinary infection, congenital heart disease, um, which causes an, an increased need for calories, um, certain congenital infections, including HIV, um, and then some metabolic conditions, there's a list of those there, and also uh, some neurologic conditions which can interfere with adequate feeding or cues around that. Specifically, if we want to look at the gastrointestinal tract, there can be certain food allergies that are an issue. Um, gastroesophageal reflux is a, is a somewhat common reason. So lots of babies are what we term happy spitters. You know, they're a little overfull or they tend to, to reflux um, fairly often. Um, that can be, you know, sort of troublesome to deal with, but not really a major problem most of the time. So I always like to give the image, you know, that the stomach is like an untied balloon. And if it simply becomes too full and any pressure goes on the balloon, it's just gonna come up and out. And that's really a, a good way to picture what benign gastroesophageal reflux is. But occasionally, children can have it to a really problematic level, um, or it doesn't resolve in the time period that it normally should, and then that can lead to growth problems. Um, cystic fibrosis is another uncommon uh, reason for failure to thrive, but that's always an issue for patients who have cystic fibrosis. Celiac disease is a bit more common, probably is more common than we even know. Um, but that is a, um, an intolerance of uh, gluten in the diet that leads to inflammation in the uh, small intestine and uh, malabsorption that can result from that. And then inflammatory bowel disease, you may be familiar with Crohn's disease, things of that nature that again can cause chronic irritation and malabsorption. And all of these things have the potential to affect normal growth and development. I wanted to talk specifically about iron status uh, for infants. So 80% um, of iron transfers from uh, the mother to the fetus, to the uh, unborn child in the third trimester. So <clears throat> babies who are born sufficiently prematurely, so for sure if they're born at less than 36 weeks gestation require additional uh, iron supplementation. So normally um, when babies are born with a certain hemoglobin level and that, that kind of drops off and reaches its natural nadir somewhere around uh, like eight uh, to 10 weeks of age, and then it, it gradually corrects. Um, at six months, infants do need some sort of supplemental you know, dietary iron. Um, so standard infant formula usually provides enough um, and then by eight or nine months of age, or you know, somewhere before then even, we're starting the cereals and then often meats in the diet, so it's sufficient. Um, breast milk does not have a sufficient amount, as we mentioned. And we do see, not, you know, not uncommonly, we can see problems where despite the fact that a baby's being breastfed, which is wonderful, uh, if there are problems with initiating solid foods, uh, so that the baby maybe is kind of just snacking at the breast very frequently instead of really eating sufficient, sufficient amounts of solid foods, uh, particularly infant cereal, they can become iron deficient. So we do have to take a careful diet history around that. <clears throat> and uh, similarly, uh, you know, toddlers uh, as well, of course, have their specific iron requirements. And so we want to make sure that as toddlers are um, you know, have their diet of uh, drinking some milk or perhaps still uh, breastfeeding, uh, and they're starting to have their likes and dislikes, uh, that we're making sure that they do have three meals, two snacks a day, and that we're offering a good variety of foods. I will often recommend um, for uh, particularly um, toddlers who are just beyond a year of age, 
to consider continuing the uh, infant cereals for a source of iron if they're not otherwise uh, eating well. <clears throat> you can see infant cereal really is an excellent source of that. We do screens in the uh, in regular practice between, we do a screen between nine and uh, 12 months of age for hemoglobin. And then uh, we test again at two years of age. And the reason we do this so frequently uh, first of all, obviously we don't want babies to be anemic, um, but anemia is actually sort of a later uh, manifestation of iron deficiency and iron's important for normal development. It's important for normal uh, brain maturation and development. So we wanna make sure that our infants and toddlers in particular are getting enough. Uh, for preschool children, uh, so now we're into the, you know, the two, three, four uh, age group. Uh, we make the transition to 2% milk. Uh, we do uh, routinely have discussions about avoiding excessive milk, for sure, or less than 32 ounces a day. Um, we usually counsel less than 24 ounces a day. Um, excessive cow milk can cause irritation to the GI tract, um, and that can lead to uh, some uh, sort of uh, micro invisible blood loss in the stool and lead to iron deficiency. And of course, also, uh, if children are over consuming milk, particularly in the waking up in the middle of the night still, that can lead to um, uh, baby bottle uh, cavities. Uh, we wanna limit juice and soda for some of the same reasons, but also because they really, uh, soda of course, and even juice do not really provide any additional nutrition to the diet. Uh, juice versus whole fruits and vegetables is a common discussion in the office. And, um, you know, while it's certainly okay if someone's using a Nutribullet or something like that, and they're making juice from uh, fruits and vegetables at home, is a little bit of that okay, providing some nutrition? Yes. Uh, but when you compare that to eating a piece of fruit or a vegetable, uh, it's, it's not as good. Um, it's a constant uh, uh, task, I think, to keep encouraging new foods in young children uh, in a recognition that our taste buds grow and change with time. So, you know, for children, of course, uh, something that's sweet is often very appealing right away and something that's more savory or certainly anything that's bitter um, may not be as appealing. And so they have to try it multiple times. So we are often reminding parents that, you know, you have to, you know, introduce things five or six times or sometimes more until they will actually develop the taste for that. Uh, and then uh, the last item here about a um, avoiding, you know, sort of classic snack foods uh, in the diet. So I very frequently will explain that, you know, a snack for a toddler is really designed to be something, you know, approaching or slightly less than 100 calories, but that is a nutritious supplement to meals. So we know sometimes toddlers are super busy, you know, they'll take a few bites at mealtime, they're done, they move on. Okay. Uh, but when they come back later that they are hungry or they want something to eat, it is, it's um, appropriate to either go back to the plate, to the healthy food that's on the plate, or to say, okay, uh, let's figure out, you know, or think sort of mentally review what have they had to eat today. Gee, they haven't really had much in the way of fruits or vegetables, or uh, gee, you know, they haven't really had any protein today or that much. And so designing a snack around that. So we often talk about trying to pair, to, um, to P-A-I-R, to, to pair a fruit or a vegetable with a protein as a, as a really uh, nutritious snack and not thinking about a snack as a treat or a dessert because that's not really what they're designed to be. So, um, I, uh, I talked about this with the medical students and we did a little quiz on one time that, that a two-year-old comes in for a well visit. And this is a super common thing where the, uh, the, the concern will be that you know, the child is a picky eater, not my term. That's the term we, we often will hear from uh, concerned parents. Won't, uh, you know, is refusing to eat uh, meats, often meats, uh, but sometimes fruits and vegetables as well. And the child 
is drinking, when you get the history, when you really take a careful history, you know, is having five or six eight ounce, um, maybe still bottles or cups of milk a day. And so, you know, the question being, how would you assess and how would you proceed? And of course, based on what we've just said, um, and I, I'm not sure if I talk about that on the next slide or not, Catherine, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, that, that that is an excessive amount of milk. And sometimes it can be milk and juice. And really they're just kind of topping off all the time with liquids and not really allowing them for a good healthy appetite. So, um, you know, we talk about, again, setting limits around that. And uh, I, one of my particular interests is, is uh, in nutrition for children. So I, I have a nutrition clinic that I run at the children's clinic. I see both, you know, underweight and overweight children. And we have this discussion about limit setting very, very frequently. I honestly believe that limit setting is one of the hardest tasks uh, of parenting. Uh, you know, having, you know, raised two children myself and faced some of these, you know, same, same challenges, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing where it, when you can offer choices and you can make it seem like it's their idea or that it's fun, of course, all goes well. But when you're either tired or you're out of energy to figure out how to make it look that way, uh, it can be, you know, more challenging to enforce a limit. But in general, we talk about how parents decide when it's time to eat, what food will be served and how much, you know, they're putting on the plate for the child. And the child just, you know, chooses from what is, uh, what is provided, you know, what they're going to eat and when they are full. Uh, but we talk about how, you know, what, what's, what's not appropriate limit, set, limit setting is for them to say, you know, no, I don't want any of that. I want this instead. And so when that process starts to happen, or when they don't eat what's on the plate and they come back a half hour, an hour later, asking for a cookie or something along those lines, and that's what they kind of end up getting in the, in the desire to find something, you know, that the child will eat, the child's then driving the bus on uh, decisions around nutrition, and that usually doesn't go in a healthy direction. So really uh, sticking to those appropriate settings, uh, you know, limit setting around nutrition is important. And as I mentioned, uh, three meals, two snacks, snacks supplement the meal and avoiding what I call the slippery slope of chasing children to get them to eat something, right? Finding something that they'll eat often leads in a direction that is not optimal in terms of nutrition. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like, of course, children are not ever going to have dessert or a treat because of course they are. But when we're talking about our daily nutrition habits, we, you know, generally want to follow these guidelines. Okay. Um, and again, if we're um, seeing a toddler who is excessively gaining weight, is overweight, uh, we, and we have these discussions about limit setting, about what are they drinking? Are they you know, consuming too much milk or uh, juice in excess or other, other things you know, already? Um, what kinds of snacks? Is there still an overnight bottle being given? Uh, is there still breastfeeding in the middle of the night? Uh, and we always ask about food insecurity because food insecurity is a major risk factor for both underweight and overweight. And when we talk about underweight, I think that the link from underweight to uh, brain health and, and normal development is kind of more intuitive for people. Um, but uh, I do want to uh, just raise awareness that uh, I do see children who maybe starting as toddlers have habits, eating habits that aren't healthy, you know, in the, they become, you know, significantly unhealthy and they can then get to a weight where it really impacts, again, has the potential to impact their development and their quality of life. And I do treat many of those children who are severely impacted by that. So, I'm, you know, I, that's why I try to counsel so very carefully around good habits when they're younger. So this is a little, a little uh, fun handout that we developed 
uh, for um, healthy habits is the 5210 handout that we redesigned for kids. And it talks about encouraging um, at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And for children, again, that doesn't mean it has to be a large amount. You know, for a toddler, you know, a few sections of orange is, is a serving. Um, we do talk about as well limiting the electronic time. And for toddlers, electronic time should be really virtually none. Uh, but then old, you know, older than the age of two to three, you know, some, some um, electronic time can be appropriate, but limiting that and really encouraging physical activity uh, and focusing on uh, focusing on milk and water uh, as our main uh, beverages that are nutritious for us. Let's see. And then we, we take that message down under the age of two with some of the same uh, points, um, remembering that um, for the zeros, you know, breast is best, don't overfeed, no juice initially in the first year at least, and very little after that. Uh, ample free play time, physical activity, reading, and games to engage the mind, um, discouraging excessive television or screen time. Uh, oh, another thing I didn't mention before, but really avoiding a television in the bedroom. Um, television in the bedroom is a very significant risk factor for uh, inadequate sleep or unhealthy sleep habits. Uh, so we do discourage that. Um, my children survived with no TV <laughs> in their bedrooms. Uh, and in encouraging our children to self-soothe uh, for a sleep routine uh, so that they can you know, have adequate sleep at night uh, that's not affected. So not affected by electronic stimulation or, or trying to have them go to sleep in front of the TV, which is something that I will also see fairly commonly is that you know, I would put them in bed with the TV on and they go to sleep, sort of like background noise. Um, a white noise machine is great, but a TV is, is not great for that. Um, <clears throat> I will say, I will sidetrack just for a minute, but sleep is, re is really related to development very closely as well. So I will just mention that two months is the age at which I start to recommend to families separating feeding from sleeping. So that means that at, you know, by two months of age, I'm saying, you know, after the last feeding, uh, either a breastfeeding or bottle feeding at two months, um, we don't wanna just nurse or rock the baby to sleep and then put your baby into the bed asleep. We wanna allow for a process for the baby to fall asleep in the bassinet or crib. So, if the baby falls asleep at the breast, for example, we give a bath, maybe a little massage, you know, some lotions, some nice, you know, time together that way, and then into the bassinet or crib awake and allowing the baby to fall asleep on his or her own. Um, and that's not to say, of course, that we expect a two month old baby to sleep through the night, but because we don't, but we're starting to develop those habits of self soothing instead of relying on nursing as a way to soothe to go to sleep. Uh, and then our five, of course, as we mentioned, is the fruits and vegetables. And I'll um, add to that, uh, you know, the importance of introducing whole grains and some, uh, depending on your dietary preferences at this point, lean dairy and protein in the diet, some kind of protein in the diet and perhaps lean dairy. Yeah. There's our healthy plate being pictured there which we see is half fruits and vegetables, and then the other half divided between our protein and grains and uh, serving of milk if we choose, yeah, milk or water. Um, let's see, given our time, I'm gonna stop. Um, well, uh, Catherine, do you mind just fast forwarding? Um, we, I'll just summarize that very quickly by saying, that we do um, screen for food insecurity among our families and we have pro programs established uh, at uh, both, both at Valley Health Partners and within uh, the Children's Hospital to try to connect families to community resources to address any unmet needs. Yeah. Take it away, Catherine. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Brown, that was wonderful. So I'm going to continue the discussion, uh, focusing really on the brain health aspect of things. And just to put a disclaimer out there, anything, you know, 
you don't want to go ahead and start like a new diet or a new, um, you know, physical activity workout without consulting with your own personal physician. So this is, um, just kind of general information, but you definitely want to consult with your physician for your personal individual needs as well. So we were just talking about the my plate and Dr. Brown did a great job of focusing on different, um, food servings and how many, uh, servings we should be getting of our foods for our balanced diet. Um, so based on the age, there's a general range, but generally we want to make sure we're getting one to two cups of fruit, one to four cups of veggies. So using those really to enhance our meals for our snacks, um, dairy, two to three cups, if our uh, bellies will tolerate it or some sort of substitution there, the protein, two to six ounces of protein a day, depending on the age. And we want to make sure we're getting our grains as well. So three to 10 ounces, depending on our age. And so I wanted to just talk briefly about carbs and sugar, because there's a lot of uh, information in the media about carbs and they're getting such a bad rap right now. So I wanted to kind of clear the air from a dietitian perspective that carbohydrates are found in our starches, our grains, our fruits, our dairy products, our starchy vegetables, and our sweets and desserts. So there's really no such thing as like a good food, bad food here. Just they have carbs, you know, your fruits are great for you, but they have those natural sugars. Carbohydrates are meant to be our primary source of energy for our bodies. Um, and they make up about 45 to 60% of our diet of our daily intake. What happens is when our bodies don't get enough carbohydrates, enough nutrients to create that energy, it starts looking for other parts of our body. And so it starts eating away at our muscle mass. And that's how we become malnourished, um, leaning down that road. So we really, you know, avoid malnutrition with our children. And so we want to make sure we're getting an adequate amount of carbohydrates. Um, not all carbohydrates are sugars, but all sugars are carbohydrates. And that's basically, um, a chemistry thing there that our carbohydrates are made up of a lot of different factors, including our fibers. And so we want to make sure we are getting those carbohydrates. As Dr. Brown said, we want to make at least half of our grains whole grains. So we have those fibers and those nutrients instead of some of that bleached out white bread, white rice, um, and to kind of get a balance there. And we want to avoid added sugar for children under the age of two. And after that, we want to make sure it's no more than 10% of our daily intake, according to the new dietary guidelines that are out. Some other dietary guidelines I wanted to just throw in there for you. Um, saturated fat, we try to make less than 10% of our daily calories for children over the age of two. And for sodium, sodium is, you know, a big topic for a lot of people um, causing hyper, you know, part of hypertension, congestive heart failure. So we really try to avoid excess sodium. So we try to aim for less than 2,300 milligrams a day with our children under 14 years. And you can see in this graphic, we don't always realize how much salt is in a serving. Um, they say like a pinch of salt is typically about 600 milligrams. So it's very easy to add up to that 2,300 milligrams every day. And then there's a couple diets that are involved with the neurologic um, development as well that were medical diets that have kind of become fad diets. And so I always like to share some information about these because it's very easy to get misled through the through social media and the news. The ketogenic diet was originally created for adults and children with epilepsy. It's a high fat, high protein diet and a very large low carb diet that is medically managed, um, usually with a diet and a physician, um, and you put the body in ketosis, and it kind of helps to manage the number of seizures that these people have. And when they're successful on this diet, they are not on this diet for more than two years, because it has um, the potential to really affect the other organs with such a high fat and protein load. Um, so I know um, that's a big diet in the media these days. And so we try to discourage that um, unless we're using it for epilepsy or another neurologic condition. And that's something you certainly they want to be under a doctor's care for um, when you're embarking on that diet. And then also the gluten-free diet. Um, there's always a lot of information about gluten-free and we did touch on celiac disease, which is an autoimmune reaction to gluten causing inflammation and a lot of GI symptoms that the body just cannot break it up. And that happens to more people than we know, like Dr. Brown said, you can have a gluten allergy or severe insensitivity. Um, that's usually diagnosed with an allergist or a gastroenterologist physician. And so we want to make sure that people are getting the medical care for that 
that. But what happened is when all the gluten-free products hit the shelves, people um, started taking that as thinking it's a way to lose weight. But actually, when the, when the gluten is taken out of some of these products, they're putting other fillers in and people haven't realized that these products sometimes are a lot heavier and higher in calories um, and higher in fat. So sometimes people get really confused looking at those food labels, comparing them. So those are certainly things that you'd want to talk to your physician about if you're interested or have some questions or concerns about those particular diets for yourself. But focusing on brain health now, um, a big part of our brain health and development is our omega-3 fatty acids, and we'll discuss what foods have those. Also want to making sure we have adequate nutrition and hydration to fuel the body in general, because if I tell people there's no gas in the car, the car's not going. So we got to make sure that we have the adequate nutrition to fuel the body and also making sure we're getting physical activity so our bodies can exercise and, um, you know, continue to be used as well. So our omega-3 fatty acids, so we have our polyunsaturated fatty acids, and these promote um, normal function of the brain and the nervous system. They, um, there's been research done that they may help behavioral or psychological conditions. They may help lower cholesterol and they support he uh, heart health. They can even protect against dry eye disease. So that's always a benefit for people. And they help to reduce inflammation in the body. There's three types of omega-3 fatty acids. There's the DHA, which is probably one of the most popular ones. We hear a lot about that, especially um, when it comes to pregnancy and breastfeeding and uh, fetal brain development. There's ALA and there's EPA. And so your body actually cannot make omega-3 fatty acids. So that's why we're always making sure that we're getting enough omega-3s when um, we are creating um, a fetus. So, um, so here are some foods that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Our fatty fish, those are probably our biggest source of omega-3s. Your salmon, your herring, sardines, albacore tuna, lake trout, um, Atlantic and Pacific mackerel. And so we recommend eating these at least twice a week or eight ounces per week. However, there are people that are allergic to fish, they just don't like fish, they don't like the smell of it, um, and that's perfectly fine. You are not, um, you know, out of the loop as far as getting your omega-3s in. We, you know, beef has omega-3s, soybeans, walnuts and walnut oil, ground flaxseed or flaxseed oil, chia seeds, hemp seeds, Brussels sprouts even, and alga oil. So we can use those to enhance our diet to get our omega-3s in. Also many foods like our eggs, milk, and soy are now fortified with omega-3 fatty acids. And that's um, to help too with um, fetal brain development, sort of like um, when they started uh, fortifying foods with folic acid to help prevent spina bifida. And so we were making sure our um, population's getting enough of these um, nutrients. Um, like I said, if you don't eat fish, you um, can see if you need a supplement you know, talk to your doctor about that, but you can also get it through those other foods and the fortified foods. Um, many of the supplements are made with fish oil, seaweed, or microalgae. Yeah, this is Kim uh, Brown. I just wanted to add, so I, uh, I don't eat meat, um, rarely would eat fish, and, you know, I really rely on um, uh, vegetarian sources, uh, but I, uh, you know, I think Usually most um, vegetable or grain or nut sources are, are ALA. Um, and so as, and, and your body can convert, it can convert from one to the other. Uh, so if you're eating a lot of uh, foods that provide ALA, it can convert to the others, but I will kind of, you know, review my diet and think about how many sources I've had. And I take, uh, I do take an alga oil supplement, um, you know, to make sure I'm getting enough. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And so to focus on omega-3s for pregnancy, um, like I said, it's for uh, proper fetal brain development. Women who are pregnant or breastfeeding should consume eight to 12 ounces of low mercury omega-3 rich food, uh, fish and seafood, avoiding shark and swordfish, but also to can supplement or use the alternative foods that are not fish related. And most times uh, women are gonna be taking supplements as well to make sure we are getting enough of those omega-3s in there. 
And then in case anyone was interested, I put in some recommendations for how many um, the recommended amounts of omega-3s for children based on different age groups. As you see, it is um, pretty small and chances are they will need it with their diet if they have a variety of foods incorporated. But if they're lacking in a certain area, it might be um, reasonable to talk to the pediatrician or a registered dietitian about what sort of supplements need to be added to make sure that they're getting enough omega-3s. Also our cruciferous vegetables, our uh, green leafy vegetables, our broccoli, um, those are gonna be help helpful for memory support and our dark berries because of those anthocyanins. So our blueberries, blackberries and cherries really help with that memory support as well. And so I don't know about you guys, but I commonly hear and I personally experience that breakfast is something that is easily skipped in the morning. And it's probably a conversation I have with especially the teenagers in the hospital quite frequently that we need to get breakfast back on the table. Um, whether it's because we're trying to run off to school or we're just not feeling good in the morning. For me, I was so stressed about school. I didn't want to eat breakfast. But the good news is you can retrain your body to have those hunger signals come back. And now after spending time in my 20s, getting those hunger signals back, I now get hangry if I don't eat breakfast by a certain time. So that's really good news. Um, and I tell everyone that it can happen for you to start small and keep adding uh, to that meal to support your body, because it really is the most important meal of the day. Um, it helps to maintain a healthy weight. So you're not binging on food later. It helps you to wake up and get your day started. Your kids are less likely to be tardy for school, which is a big help for you guys out there. Um, studies have shown that these kids who eat breakfast have better grades in math, reading, and standardized testing. And I know for me in the high school, they would give us free breakfast before standardized tests just to help with those uh, test scores. There's improved memory, recall, concentration, fewer behavioral problems, and it creates a long, healthy you know, habits for your nutrition. So it really is the most important meal of the day. It breaks that literal fast from when we're sleeping. But lunch is just as important because you need to be able to get fuel for the rest of your afternoon. Skipping lunch can lead to poor concentration, um, uh, poor sports activity, um, overeating, after school snacks. I don't know how many of your kids come home and eat the entire pantry and still are hungry because they're just trying to make up for what they didn't have because they burned so much in the afternoon or you know, from not eating breakfast. And the other thing too, I tell parents is that your children learn from your eating habits. So in our society prior to COVID, we were always running and going and especially with the extracurricular activities, eating dinner together is not something that always happens. And so I think it was really awesome during the period of the pandemic, we all got to spend time at the dinner table together. So I encourage you to try to continue that as best you can moving forward, because not only will your kids pick up the habits that you have as far as the eating goes, but it really normalizes our feelings around eating. It normalizes our relationship with food and kind of creates that stronger bond amongst family members as well. And then like um, Dr. Brown said, using the snacking as an opportunity to enhance the meals and to get your fruit and veggie servings in rather than trying to think of it as like treats and snacks. Then I wanted to talk a few moments about autism spectrum disorders because it is related to brain health and everything. I get this question very often about what foods affect um, autism spectrum disorders. And the thing is nutrition is a big part of it, but not for um, the reasons that people necessarily think. Um, there really isn't any research, concrete research to support any sort of restrictive diet or avoidance of any foods for children on the autism spectrum disorder. However, I will say that there totally is research that supports um, texture, um, you know, sensory issues that support um, microbiome changes. And so I have kids on all sides of the autism spectrum disorder come into the hospital, sometimes with very limited diets. And so it's our job to figure out how to enhance those diets to help making sure their body gets everything that they need and while also being able to tolerate it. So some 
tip I, tips I have for parents um, is to make their mealtimes routine. I know a lot of kids with autism spectrum disorders really do well with routine um, to limit those distractions at the meal table. And that's for all children, you know, to turn off the TV and the electronics to really just hone in on the meal itself to not only enjoy the meal and not just scarf it down, but to also make the meal time more of a regular, um, non-stressful, non-anxious providing thing. Want to limit the food selection or avoid strong dislikes for the child. Um, I have kids that on the autism spectrum disorder that only eat cheese based things. And so therefore their diet is so limited, but they know that they're going to eat these cheese based things. So we supplement with other soups, um, you know, formulas and uh, drinks and everything. But we want to make sure that we're not causing too many behavioral disturbances around the mealtime either. So like I said, certainly want to seek guidance from a pediatrician and a registered dietitian to assist with um, weight maintenance, to making sure that we're not gaining weight too rapidly based on what we're eating or we're not losing weight too rapidly and looking for possible nutrient deficiencies. And then too, many people don't realize that a lot of the medications used in autism spectrum disorders have effects on the appetite, whether enlarging them or making them very small. So that has a big impact on that as well. And then I mentioned hydration, physical activity. Um, it's just good to keep your body moving. It clears your mind. Um, and you want to make sure you're getting about 60 minutes of physical activity every day. Now that the weather is starting to get nicer, get out there and take those walks. Um, as far as hydration goes, hydration amounts vary based on age and based on body type and what kind of activity you're doing. So I tell people just to check your pee, making sure it's uh, light yellow to clear, making sure you're getting enough fluid. If you're going to be physically active, Active, make sure you're drinking 12 to 16 ounces of uh, water before and after each activity. We typically avoid sports drinks with our pediatric patients um, unless they're being uh, physically active for longer than an hour and they need those electrolyte replacements. But we do try to avoid the Gatorade and the Powerade just because it's a lot of excess sugar. And so if you're looking for some resources after this presentation, um, these are some of the websites that uh, the dietitians use often, eatright.org, choosemyplate.gov, and the dietaryguidelines.gov. And after, that's all I have. So. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions for you. Um, starting with actually something that you just mentioned. You talked about um, microbiome changes. Can you touch upon that and explain what that is? That's a good question. So there are um, there are studies that show. So we all have good bacteria that live in our intestines um, that help to break down our food and are involved with all of that. And um, there are studies that show even what type of birth you had can affect your gut microbiome. What type of, um, if you've been on antibiotics, it can affect your gut microbiome, um, depending on different infections or different diseases or things. And so um, there are some studies that talk about the gut microbiome with uh, children with autism as well. And so it's something to explore more with a physician, but it's very interesting for example, say someone is on um, an antibiotic, we recommend taking it with yogurt for those, uh, those prebiotics to kind of help protect some of that gut microbiome. Because I don't know about you guys, but like if I'm on an antibiotic, my stomach is killing me, you know, and, the, and it kind of wipes out some of that good bacteria too. So we want to make sure that good bacteria is flourishing in our intestines to help with that healthy digestion. Awesome, thank you. Um, here's another question about the topping off. I know Dr. Brown, you're talking about um, the, um, I guess, milk and topping off and kind of always being full. Does that apply to water also? What if you have a child that is constantly thirsty? I mean, also constantly on the move, but is it still, would you still be concerned about them topping off? So uh, we encourage water consumption for sure. Um, and, oh, there we go, yeah. So, uh, so water is of course not a source of calories, but we do need to drink a lot of water to be adequately hydrated. And I think, you know, a lot of us, myself included, do not drink enough water. 
and we need to encourage our children to do so, it's very easy for them to develop a taste for sweet beverages instead of plain water. Um, so I will advise instead, you know, if you want to do some kind of flavored water at home, that works too. You can slice some, uh, you know, lemon or lime or something and put in that. And drinking water in between meals is actually a good thing to do. Yeah, so we recommend that. Great. I have a question from um, from Facebook. Um, I've heard that I've heard that you should drink skim milk because it's low fat, and then you should drink whole milk because it's natural, healthy fat. That you should not drink um, milk because it's bad for you, made from baby, <laughs> made for baby cows. That organic milk is good, and that organic milk isn't really organic unless you buy from local. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on and on, but of course, the and final it's all question. True. The final question is, what's the deal with milk and dairy? Awesome. So, yeah, so milk is, you know, milk is just so important for it, the protein and the vitamin D and the calcium and the bone density, because once we leave adolescence, our bone density doesn't enhance. So we want to make sure we're getting all that calcium and vitamin D from the dairy when we can. Um, and so many people miss out on that. Um, of course, if you're lactose intolerant, we don't want to cause any more issues. If you have a dairy allergy, we want to find some substitutions there for you. So like Dr. Brown said, typically we start whole milk at the age of one. And then the reason that we go to that 2% or even the 1% or skim is to decrease the amount of fat that the kids are getting. Um, we typically only use whole milk for some of our malnourished kids for those extra calories and protein. Um, typically we try to go to a lower fat milk, whether it's 1% or skim to, um, you know, prevent some of that excess fat intake. Um, but I know not everyone can tolerate the thinness of the skim. So, you know, I say anywhere between the one, 2% skim, whatever is best tolerated. As far as the organic and everything like that, um, it varies, you know, and there really isn't, at least in my opinion, not a huge difference with the organic versus the non-organic. I totally um, support using cow's milk unless there's some other reason not to, just because it has that iron and it has that protein and everything in it. Um, but we, we adjust situationally. And Dr. Ben, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. <laughs> So I would like to emphasize that it, that milk, uh, and it doesn't, this applies to things other than cow milk, other milk sources, but milk is a very important source of calcium, vitamin D and protein in our diet. And so if we make the decision that we are not going to, for, you know, for whatever reason, say, you know, if you're a vegan diet and you say, you know, we are not going to serve cow's milk. Okay, fine. But we then need to find alternative sources for calcium, vitamin D and protein. So almond milk, for example, can sometimes be fortified with those. Almond milk does not have as much protein. It does some pro has some protein. It is not as environmentally friendly as we might think. It takes a lot of water actually to make almond milk. Um, and so there, you know, there's lots of balances in that, um, in that decision. Soy milk is another option. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, and of course, lactate milk for those who are lactose intolerant. So there's all these issues that come up. Whole milk is for, is for one to two years of age um, or, children who are underweight, you know, need the extra calories. Generally at two, we're going to 2% or even 1%. And school age kids, 1% milk is fine. If you're serving skim milk in your house, that is also fine. Um, going from whole milk to skim is a tough switch for kids. For kids who are overweight and they're drinking whole milk at home, we say absolutely, you know, the the difference between whole milk and you know one percent milk is just the fat content, and it's not healthy fat; it's animal fat. So, uh, so we say you know go to one percent, but I always say say take a pause at two percent first because it's a lot easier to go from whole to two percent, etc. So uh, I hope that answered the questions. But yeah, you can hear anything. There's so much about milk, uh, but um, you know I grew up drinking cow milk. 
uh, I became sort of less tolerant of cow milk with time. And so I drink almond milk now and I'm perfectly, and I'm, I'm sometimes drinking oat milk. I'm trying that. Uh, but I do, um, you know, again, I'm looking for something with enough calcium and it's vitally important, especially for girls to be, you know, getting that calcium. So they build up their bone strength because of course, when, as we get older, and Catherine's point is quite correct. You only accrue bone density uh, into your early 20s at, at most. And then it's level maybe for a bit and then you start to lose. So weight bearing, calcium and vitamin D, very important to maintaining our bone strength. We look at the long-term and, you know, and the short-term. Yeah. That's good. Um, mm -hmm. If you choose to go with an alternative milk, can you, like almond milk, can mm -hmm. you, Substitute that protein with adding more, I guess, fish or meat to your diet? Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like you have to get your protein from milk. Just to be aware that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have as much. And I, you know, people will ask about, so one of the things, for example, so I see lots of children who just don't like milk. They won't drink milk. They're not used to it. You know, whatever. They don't want to drink milk. And so we talk about, you know, yogurt, some cheese, not excessive cheese, but, you know, yogurt. Um, you can, of course, get calcium from things like broccoli and, you know, vegetables. You can get your calcium. But we, I do, I, and that's a situation where I will say to a family, you know, orange juice is, you can buy, you can buy orange juice that is supplemented with the same amount of calcium and vitamin D as a glass of milk. Um, and I, but I always give them the caveat, but it doesn't have any protein in it. Okay. So it has vitamin C, but it's easy for us to get vitamin C in our diet. Um, but it doesn't have protein. So, you know, but again, you can get your protein from beans or your meats or fish or, you know, whatever else you have. Yeah. I agree. Um, I have a parent asking if I want nutrition counseling for my child, do I need a referral from a pediatrician? Hmm. So um, I would hope <laughs> that your pediatrician can give you some counseling if you need that. Um, so it depends, my answer to that is it depends on the need, like what the need is and the specific need. And it depends on, on your practice environment. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, if it's basic nutrition counseling, your, nutrition, your, your pediatrician should be able to provide that. Um, if, on the other hand, you're trying to plan a diet around, um, you know, a certain medical need, you may need consultation with a dietitian for that. If you're trying to plan a diet around particular allergies, you may need help with that. Uh, so um, a, a dietitian is uh, trained much more extensively in nutrition than, than most general pediatricians are. So we, um, you know, like I spend a lot of time doing nutrition counseling, but if I had a question, if I wasn't sure about something, I would still turn to Catherine for the answer on that. Okay, so just to kind of draw some differences. So um, if you go to see a subspecialist for a particular reason, they often have dietitians who are working with them there in the office. In the children's clinic, we have dietitian, we have a dietitian who works with me or who can, you know, we make a separate appointment to see the dietitian. Um, if you are in a private practice setting, um, they, you, they might be able to refer to a dietitian for a specific question. If you just wanted to schedule an appointment to talk with your pediatrician because you have questions about the diet or about the nutrition, you probably can do that as well. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add to a common question I get is what's the difference between a diet, a registered dietitian and a nutritionist. And so um, to figure out the difference between the two. A nutritionist can be anybody. Anyone can just say, I'm a nutritionist. Sometimes there's certificates online or, or, or chiropractors become nutritionists. Um, a registered dietitian goes through um, degree programs, does a 1200 hour internship and takes board certified exams. So you always wanna look for a registered dietitian to know that you are getting ethical and scientific based information. And then if you, so 
like Dr. Brown was saying, it really depends on what practice you are with. Um, LVHN has dietitians. Um, St. Luke's has dietitians. If you're looking for a dietitian, you can always go to eatright.org and there's a, a place to find a dietitian. You can put in your zip code and you can look for dietitians in your area. Thank you. I have another question coming from Facebook. Um, more greens, less greens, some greens are not good for you. What's, what's the deal with greens? Oh, more greens. <laughs> <laughs> more greens, hands mm -hmm. down. Yep. So I'll start and hand off to Catherine. So uh, the more plant forward, the better. Uh, greens, certain types of greens are more nutritious than others, but, um, you know, for a, uh, for a very nutritious diet, plant forward. Now that doesn't mean, you know, I think eating, being, and I'm not saying you need to be vegan. I'm not saying that at all. Some people choose to be vegan. That's great. Um, if they choose to be vegan, um, there are certain dietary needs that are tough to meet with being vegan. You have to be aware of that. Um, but plant forward 100%. Um, so that means just trying to incorporate, you know, fruits and vegetables into your diet as much as you can at every meal. Um, you know, kale, spinach, uh, turnips, you know, if you mean really like leafy greens, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Um, arugula. Um, those are all, you know, good sources, um, green vegetables, also good, you know, green beans, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, asparagus, bring it on. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I tell people the darker, the green, the better it is, you know, so our, our arugula, our spinach, our kale is going to have more nutrients than kind of like our romaine or iceberg. Um, I personally love the, the spring mix. Uh, so you love everything. Um, but, and I tell people too, when it comes to trying new foods with your kids, you know, our taste buds change as we get older. There's things that I like now that I did not like as a child. Um, and so really trying to incorporate a different variety, you know, there's going to be some things that they just don't like. We all have those things, but you know, having those continued experiences and continued opportunities to try them um, is going to really promote that in the future. And especially the younger they are, um, you'd be amazed at some of the things that people are able to get their kids to have because they don't know any better and they, they mm -hmm. like the taste. So definitely more greens, the better. <laughs> right. So when you're making mini pizzas, consider zucchini pizzas, for example. Um, you know, uh, you know, so zucchini rounds, uh, made into little pizzas, uh, kids love that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just about the exposure. Yeah. Uh, so the more, the more vegetables, the better, um, not necessarily a true statement for fruit. Uh, so fruit, there is such a thing as too much fruit. And we do see sometimes children who are over consuming fruit. Um, that can lead to excess calories. Um, it can lead to um, diarrhea uh, because of the sugar load. Uh, and things like, for example, watermelon and grapes would be much lower on my list of fruits than, for example, you know, an apple or berries, um, which, you know, or tomato, which is actually a fruit. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, watermelon just a lot of sugar and water, for example, and grapes kind of the same. Uh, so um, a banana, an apple, um, you know, just the basics, you know, pears, peaches, um, dates, you know, if you, uh, if for children who have issues with constipation, um, things like, uh, you know, prunes or pitted now, we're talking pitted, pitted prunes, pitted dates, dried apricots, again, pitted, excellent for that. Really good. Yeah. And for adults. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, organic, you know, we've heard go organic. It's so great. It's so great. Um, but you know, coming, you know, organic is also pretty pricey. So are there specific foods that people should specifically look for if they can add it to their budget that's organic? Or, you know, is it a whole 
hullabaloo nonsense. What's what's the deal with organic? You want to take that one, Catherine? To to put it in a nutshell, um, at least in my experience and my training, they're really um, the benefit doesn't outweigh the cost, and there really has been not no significant differences. So I personally um, don't stress organic, but I support those who, who want to and who are able to. That's pretty much the nutshell I give. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so here, here, I take a slightly different approach on that, I think. Um, and that is that organic foods generally are, of course, more expensive. So when given the choice of a non-organic apple versus, you know, uh, chips <laughs> or something, I'm going to pick the non-organic apple and I'm going to wash it right now. It's also true that some things can get incorporated into the skin, but part of eating a whole fruit is the fiber that comes from the, the peel and things like that. So, but, uh, so if it's, and if it becomes that organic food is too expensive, and so we're not going to buy fruits and vegetables, then we're going to buy the fruits and vegetables that aren't organic, and we're going to wash them, or we're going to do what we need to do to try to prepare them in a healthy way. Now, where that is not an issue, um, then yes, for some things, I actually do recommend organic. And the reason for that is that some, um, some produce cannot easily be washed and there are some that are dirtier than others. So for example, the dirt, there's, there's a list and you can look this up. It's called the dirty dozen. And then there's a clean 15. Okay. Uh, don't ask me why it's a dozen and 15. I don't know. But um, the, the dirty dozen, um, strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, potatoes. Um, I have to say, I don't usually buy organic potatoes, but if I'm buying berries, which of course are difficult to wash, I buy organic. I buy organic apples. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I don't really eat cherries, but I like, you know, I don't eat grapes, but you know, like kale and spinach, for example, I buy organic. Um, but, uh, then there's, you know, there's a list of the clean 15, which includes things like avocados. So something that's really like with a, that you're going like a cantaloupe or an orange, you know, that has a big thick peel on it. I worry about that less. Um, the clean 15 list currently is avocados, corn, pineapple, onions, papayas, uh, eggplant, asparagus, cauliflower, cantaloupe, broccoli, mushrooms, cabbage, honeydew, kiwi. Um, so I don't worry about those things, for example. Um, but I do buy uh, like, um, you know, organic of some of the fruits. Yes. And if, if you can afford that, um, I would support doing that. Great. Um, I have another question. Um, we've heard the term antioxidants a lot in the past. What exactly are antioxidants? And how can you add them or should you add them to your diet? So I'll start with uh, that. So um, in general, and I'll make this uh, sort of simple. So as we age, there is um, oxidative stress that can go on in the body that can cause a damage at a cellular level. Um, so it's related to aging, uh, it's related, can be related to things like cancer risk with time. And so things that are antioxidants tend to decrease uh, inflammation, aging, cancer risk, things like that. Uh, and so um, like some berries, for example, are an excellent source of that. And I'll let Catherine elaborate more on that, but that is the potential benefit of antioxidants. And she may have more to say on the subject. 
No, you pretty much covered it. Um, you know, you want to make sure you're including antioxidants in your diet, unless um, you've been told not to for some reason. Um, and it has specific um, nutrients um, such as vitamin A, C, E. Um, and so some, like they said, the berries are very high in antioxidants. Um, some of your um, vegetables, um, kale, for example, is very high in antioxidants. A lot of your nuts and your seeds are going to have antioxidants in them. Um, one that I enjoy is dark chocolate that has some antioxidants in it. So um, there's lots of information online as far as like food lists go, but um, you know, you want to incorporate those antioxidants in there. That's part of the uh, popularity of the acai bowl. Yes. Um, is that it's <laughs> SIE are, uh, and blueberries are both very high in antioxidants. Yeah. So a good trick when you want to plan dessert, uh, is something called the dessert flip. And, uh, the concept of that is how do you flip dessert into something that's really both nutritious and, you know, a little healthier. And so the three main building blocks to that are, um, uh, you can use dark chocolate, uh, nuts, and fruit. And so some combination of, uh, for example, something really fun is you could take uh, like some of those uh, dried apricots that we talked about, dip it in a little dark chocolate and, uh, or make a little tray where you've dipped some fruits in some dark chocolate. And that's, um, that's a really nice dessert. Or um, one of my favorite things to do is I love red pears. Red pears, when ripened just so, and they're not quite as just so as avocados are just so, uh, you know, but red pears ripen to the point of being just soft at the tip, slicing that and having it with a little bit of dark chocolate. Delicious. Love that. I'm going to have to add that to our mm -hmm. dessert one time. Um, speaking of dessert, so we, I've heard snack should be once between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner. But then I've also heard that snack can be after dinner. Um, where does that second snack lie? And then, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of this idea of the second dinner. My kid is done with dinner. <laughs> And it's 10 minutes to bedtime and suddenly they're starving and they're yeah. for another meal. So, you know, how do we handle that second dinner? Um, is the child really hungry? Do we give them enough to, you know, another meal that they say they're starving for? Do we top it off with just a snack or something to drink? Where's, where's the guidance for that? I think it's important to evaluate everyone individually. And I'll, I usually say the statement that I am not like a diet calorie counting dietitian. I am very much a health at every size and just having the general body acceptance and relationship with food. That being said, I am a huge proponent for second dinner myself, whether or not it's my best option, it's another story. So sometimes people do better with three meals a day and those two snacks and your body kind of has that, um, intuitiveness. Um, all children are born with like an intuitive hunger signal mindfulness. And that really shows itself during um, like breastfeeding, you know, the child feeding until they're full and then, you know, stopping when they're done and then starting again when they're hungry again. Um, we override those hunger signals in our culture between either overeating, undereating, um, overindulging, those sorts of things. And so it is totally possible to regain those hunger signals and everyone's body's a little bit different. So sometimes, like I said, people do well with three meals a day. Sometimes people find they need a snack in between breakfast and lunch. I think that's the, I think the common snack times came from school time snack times. You know, you have your mid morning snack, you have your afternoon snack um, where, you know, people are accustomed to having like a little dessert or a little bedtime snack. So whatever, like fits in. I never tell people that snacking is like mandatory per se, but give healthy options. Some people do better. Um, instead of having those three meals, breaking up into four five or six times a day, depending on their situation. Um, so there's some people that do well with, um, a light meal, um, at one point, and then another light meal at another point, really just having that opportunity for that balance of protein and grains and veggies. Um, so it really depends um, 
what kind of fits in with your lifestyle. And for example, for our children who are physically active, who are doing a lot of sports, we need to add some extra snacks in there for them to be successful during their sport. And then we need to feed them afterwards too. You know, they need the carbohydrates beforehand to have that energy. Then they need that protein to help heal the muscles that they were working so hard. So it really is individualized. And so, um, you know, and sometimes as, as we grow and as life changes a little bit, our situations change too. So it's a very fluid thing. Um, and probably throughout the pandemic, people have found that their eating habits changed a bit as far as the timing and the routine, simply because our whole routine, you know, crashed down. So it's, I think it's really um, important to evaluate individual needs and kind of just see what your body's telling you too. It's really important to listen to your body and to be like, okay, do I need a snack? Or am I just really bored and need to get moving? Or am I thirsty? Or is, or, you know, am I really hungry? Did I not eat a very good breakfast this morning? And now I really need a snack, you know? So kind of evaluating that. So it's a, a, a big, vague answer, but <laughs> it kind of is very individualized. So I would, I would add some uh, specific examples to that. So I will say um, a lot of people do talk a lot speak to this issue of listening to your body signals um and i as i mentioned for example when we're encouraging um older infants and toddlers to finger feed and to cue when they're done you know i've had enough don't force them to finish the plate don't make them finish the bottle uh if they're you know if they spit out the bottle spit out the breast push the food aside, they're done. And so respecting those sorts of limits is important. On the other hand, though, I see an awful lot of children who have sugar cravings and who have just habits around uh, eating when they're doing video games or watching TV. Uh, they don't want to go to bed. And so they ask for something to eat because they don't want to go to bed. And so we do have to be careful around thinking that necessarily we're getting a request for something because the child really needs to eat again. Uh, so in general, we say three meals, two snacks as again, a general guideline. It depends on what's happening at home. If you have a child who's awake at 6 a.m. every day and is having breakfast at seven and lunch isn't until noon, then yep, they're gonna need a snack between breakfast and lunch. On the other hand, if they get up at nine, then they don't, they're gonna have breakfast and then they can have lunch at noon. And then maybe, you know, at three o'clock, you know, that's when they're gonna need a snack. Uh, for sure, you know, children after school almost always need a snack. Now, if your children right now are all virtual at home, one of the things I would encourage you to try to do is to maintain a schedule for when we eat. So I'm seeing a lot of parents coming in saying, I don't know what to do. We're all virtual, we're in the house all day and my child is back and forth to the kitchen all the time. And you know, the child is gained 20 pounds in six months, which I'm seeing all the time. And so establishing limits around, uh, you know, three meals, two snacks, you know, we're not going to just constantly be back and forth snacking and eating. Um, so I have never told parents like a specific diet, a keto diet, or, a you know, any kind of named diet for their child, nor have I put a child on a calorie restriction. Now, older children, I would say, you know, like, 13 or 14 and older who really have significant obesity as a health problem for them, causing sleep apnea, um, you know, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease, type two diabetes, you know, may very much need to have that conversation in a structured weight loss environment. That is a different situation. But for the children, school age children that I'm seeing for the most part, uh, so that after school snack can be very important because very often lunch at school is at 11 o'clock and, you know, they're coming home It's four hours or more later. They're really hungry. That is a wonderful time to put out a tray of fruits and vegetables and say, have at it. 
um, and really not offering up chips or other things like that, this is the time when your children are hungry that they're more likely to explore and to try those fruits and vegetables that you may think that they're never gonna eat. So that is when I really made headway with my son in particular, he'd come home from school, he was starving or we'd all come home after sports, for example, like you were talking about Catherine, after sports, everybody's starving, I'm home from work, they're starving, I'm trying to make dinner. I would quickly put together a tray of some fruit, some vegetables, maybe yogurt or a, like a string cheese and say, okay, just you know, consider it salad before dinner, right? And, and eat up while I have a chance to you know, put something together. So that can be very important. Two specifics about uh, needing sometimes more of a meal before bed. Uh, so children who are on ADHD medication will often have their appetite suppressed through the day if they are on a stimulant medication and sometimes they're losing weight. So we very specifically talk about putting, uh, so you know they will often eat breakfast, they sort of pick at lunch at school, they maybe have a snack, they may or may not eat a very good dinner and then suddenly at eight or nine o'clock that is wearing off and they're starving, feed them a meal. So if they are, you know, particularly if it's a situation where they are losing weight or they're not eating much during the day, they really may need more like, again, depending on the age of the child, you know, a soup sandwich, you know, a half a sandwich and a bowl of soup combo or, you know, something like that that constitutes more of a meal as opposed to for the vast majority of like preschoolers uh, and young school age children you know, a piece of fruit, uh, something light after dinner, you know, a little pudding, a little yogurt, something light uh, is generally all that's needed. Growing, uh, you know, adolescence, adolescence going through that pubertal growth spurt is another time where they, you know, they talk about fourth meal, where they really may need that. Again, it depends on how the child's growing and if there's a weight problem, you know, a significant problem. But uh, for somebody who's growing well and is in that pubertal growth spurt, they just may be starving and need, again, something a little bit more substantial um, as, a, as a fourth meal, particularly if they're staying up uh, kind of late doing schoolwork or something like that, or they've been to sports, et cetera. Wow, uh, very helpful. Um, I just learned so much just now. Um, I have two more questions for you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Soy, I've heard, we've all heard soy is good for you, not good for you, add it to your diet, um, it has too much estrogen, what's the deal with soy? Go Catherine, I know you got this. <laughs> so soy um, certainly is, I want to say this, you know, an alternative for cow's milk. And it's generally where um, I have my patients start if there is an, a lactose intolerance or a dairy allergy. I will say specifically in, in infants with dairy allergy, if there's a dairy allergy, there's very commonly a soy allergy as well. Um, so for example, if we're having a breastfeeding mother and we have concerns for cow's milk protein allergy, we have them, if they choose to do the elimination diet where they're going to eliminate dairy, we also have them eliminate soy um, because very often they are tied together. Um, some people are able to grow out of that allergy. Um, but um, anywho, getting back to soy, um, and Dr. Brown probably can speak better to this. There are potential effects with the estrogen. Um, so it's always important to, I'm just gonna say, it's important to follow with your medical professionals and be able to identify any issues that you're having as far as that goes. I'm gonna let Dr. Brown take the, the scientific part of this, so. Okay, great, that's fine. So I think a very important point you just made is that when we are suspicious of cow milk protein allergy, sometimes soy co-travels with that. And so I already mentioned, we don't really recommend soy formulas except for very specific needs, galactosemia or you know specific things. Um, if we were really suspicious, uh, somebody has, if a baby has colic, um, we will go to something like an alimentum or a nutramogen, which is a partially hydrolyzed, it's a cow milk protein, but it's partially hydrolyzed already. 
Um, or there are some children who just need, um, you know, like elemental formula. That's with very severe allergies. If you're talking about somebody who's just lactose intolerant, then I encourage lactate milk and yogurt, which is generally well tolerated, even if you are lactose intolerant. Um, now, with regard to soy, I can tell you what I do personally. Um, I find soy, like for example, soy yogurt, I find is uh, like a lot of added sugar. So this is where what Catherine was talking about. You've really got to look at the added sugar and things. So fat-free yogurt, for example, not something I recommend because it typically has a lot of added sugar. Soy yogurt, for example, super sweet. Um, so I think you have to find what works. I will tell you that in the population of patients that I see, I see lots and lots of girls with super early periods. And that I think has been the concern and they have virtually zero soy in their diet. So I am really skeptical about any link between soy and the diet and early onset of puberty. Um, I am seeing kids who are following, you know, culturally following a diet that has virtually, you know, they're not drinking soy milk, they're not getting a tofu or edamame in their diet. And, uh, and we see lots of, um, of uh, you know, early onset of puberty. And the extra estrogen in, in for kids is, is often coming, you know, in kids who are overweight from adipose tissue which creates estrogen, particularly at puberty, at the time of puberty, and will advance puberty more quickly. So uh, that is something that we see much more of. That's my personal approach. So I drink almond milk, but I eat tons of tofu and um, edamame and whatnot. That is very, very interesting. Um, we spoke um, a bit about breastfeeding and nursing. Um, and I know you touched upon nursing um, really little ones, but I get the question all the time, when is it too old to continue nursing my child? Is there an age that it's no longer nutritious? Is there an age that you just need to stop? Or is there a point where medically or nutritionally that you really should stop? Personally, in my practice, um, that's a decision that I feel is made between the mother and the child, um, really feeling the child's cues for when they are ready to stop, uh, knowing that breastfeeding is not only a, an active, you know, an active feeding, but it's also a very personal relationship between the mother and the child. Um, I know there's a lot of social stigma over certain ages with breastfeeding, but um, so your breast milk composition varies between persons. So we don't know the exact calories that come from each woman. Um, it's very interesting in our NICU, we use donor breast milk and they are able to figure out the exact composition of the calories and the protein and the fat. And so we're able to see that there's a large variety um, between um, different women and their breast milk concentration calorically. Breast milk is not a huge source of protein. Um, you're so certainly it's not going to meet the nutritional needs of your child past um, the age of 12 months. So that, you know, the importance of incorporating all the other foods in the whole milk. I've had patients who are still breastfeeding within the toddler realm as like a nighttime bonding thing rather than a nutritive, you know, feeding opportunity. Um, so I think it's looking into different aspects, making sure both mom and child are still interested and receiving benefit, whether it's emotional or, um, you know, not so much nutrition, it's kind of just a little extra there, um, making sure it's not harming anybody. Um, but it's more so of a, a bond, you know, thing that we kind of let them figure out. Um, of course, I only see patients while they're in the hospital. So if there's like a, a serious issue at that point, then we kind of like let that go. Um, so for me personally, there's as long as it's having some sort of benefit, I continue to um, support it. And so I, I would add to that a couple of things. So there are some times that uh, as wonderful as breast milk is as a source of nutrition, 
there can be some problems with the routine around breastfeeding. So I will give you some specific examples. So there is an optimal time developmentally for children to learn to eat, to finger feed and to eat. And if you miss that opportunity, which is generally, we should be starting solid foods around six months of age, and certainly starting finger feeding in a developmentally normal child between, you know, as I say, I'm talking about it that it's six months, but certainly by eight to nine months. And, uh, and if you wait longer to introduce solid food into the diet, you will often have feeding difficulties. So I have had, you know, not one or two, but multiple children who I have had to actually refer to feeding therapy because they have been basically, as I mentioned before, just kind of snacking at the breast rather than really eating foods. And then they don't want to eat and are not receptive to eating because they are developmentally past the stage when they explore the world with their mouth. So at six months, children explore the world hand to mouth. That is how we do it. That's why everything, that's why you see them wanting to put everything in their mouths because they are still exploring the world with their mouths. And that's when they learn eating. And when uh, it's the same age when they're bringing their toes up to their mouths, everything's going in there. That optimal time to introduce finger feeding foods is in that time frame. So we get into trouble with children not having a proper variety of foods and proper nutrition if we aren't introducing solid foods in the proper time period. The other thing I will mention is that uh, if a child is not sleeping uh, and therefore the mother is not sleeping because the child is still demanding to be breastfed in the middle of the night. So what, I didn't really speak to this specifically, but you know, by six months of age, the baby should be sleeping through the night. And really part of that is that self-soothing process. So there's a difference between breast milk as nutrition, breastfeeding as part of bonding and using the breast as a pacifier to get back to sleep, which is not healthy. And so we don't, you know, what we want to avoid is a situation where the only way the baby or the toddler knows how to get to sleep is at the breast and then kind of at the mom all the time to breastfeed for comfort, for getting to sleep when we should be learning to comfort and to get to sleep either through self-soothing or from a hug or some other means. So those are my thought points around is breastfeeding working for me still as a mom? And is it working for my child? So I would say breastfeeding after the age of a year, sure. Um, again, in the context of it's during the day uh, or in the evening, but it's not in the middle of the night, it's not in the place of eating nutritive foods. And so just kind of balancing all of those things. I hope that answers the question. For the most part, um, is there still nutrients being given to the child um, that's nursing past a year or even past two? There's certainly, yeah, there's certainly still nutrients. Um, it's not as nutrient dense. Like it, the, the nutrition doesn't change. The composition doesn't change um, as the child ages. So it's the same nutrients you were giving to your infant. So it's not going to um, impact their nutritional intake as greatly as it did when they were relying on it solely. They kind of outgrow it nutriently, if that makes sense. It's not gonna have all the vitamins and minerals and proteins and everything that they need, so. Yeah, that makes but sense. I think I would say that in the second year of life, if your child is sleeping through the night, growing normally, developing well, eating a variety of foods and breastfeeding, you know, a couple times a day or something. Sure. I love that. Thank you. I've got one last question and it's actually more of advice. What advice can you give for parents 
or caregivers or teachers for those lunchtime social eaters that prefer to chat with their friends versus actually <laughs> eating. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so the concern is that they don't eat lunch and then they get hungry in school or they're starving when they come home from school. I'm not sure which, but I guess it could be either. Um, so I don't know that I, I get that question very often. The usual thing that I hear, and, and I'm assuming this is a school lunch. So I guess it's a difference between a packed lunch versus a school lunch. I do hear often from parents that, you know, their children, um, you know, they aren't as, they aren't as great about eating a school lunch because they don't always like the food. Usually it's the vegetable <laughs> on the plate. Um, I think that at lunchtime, you know, you're going to either pack or encourage your child to try, try some lunch, right? Try some lunch. Again, you can't set hard and fast rules because I guarantee you, if you set up a war or, you know, like you try to confront them or force something about eating, that's, you know, your child's going to win every time. So I think what could help maybe if you're packing the lunch is to talk in advance about, hey, we're going to put in, you know, these sorts of things today. Um, you know, we hope you, you know, mom's hoping or whoever's hoping that you'll at least uh, try some of these things. Looking ahead at the school lunch menu and it's kind of pointing out, hey, what are some options that you might like for today? And just kind of pointing out what those options are so they might know, you know, what they would choose. Because, you know, in some schools, you know, they, um, there's a choice of, you know, they have to have five things, they get a choice of four to five or whatever, and then they can decide about that. Um, on the other hand, if they don't eat that much at lunch, and then they're really hungry when they come home, direct them in a healthy direction. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest advice. You know, if, um, you know, they're, you can't necessarily control what happens in the lunchroom, but you can control what happens when they get home, which is mm -hmm. to say, um, you know, if they're starving when they get home, put out that tray of fruits and vegetables and let them have at it. Yeah. I'll say my mother works at an elementary school and she's always telling me, you know, this kid just did not eat because they were just too excited to talk with everyone. And um, it's been different this past year because the rule is you can't talk with anyone until your mask is back on. So mm -hmm. it's really helped some of those social eaters this time. But um, I think, you know, providing a positive environment, but it's also, you know, especially at that age, they're still learning how to interact in social situations like that. So it's an opportunity for growth. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for them to learn, Hey, if I don't eat right now, I'm going to be really hungry really soon. Um, and then giving them, you know, that, that encouragement and that, you know, that gentle, that gentle uh, push to be like, you know, we, we need to eat. Um, and, you know, it, it's different for every child, but certainly a learning experience as well. So we kind of, we roll with the punches and, um, you know, if it's severely impacting their nutrition, then we'll, we'll come up with alternatives for sure. But, um, you know, it certainly is exciting for children to be in that social situation. So Thank you both for yeah. this amazing evening. I personally have learned so much. I'm impressed with all the questions that have been asked before, during um, the session. I've learned so much that I can take away with me tonight. Um, and thank you again for giving us your time, for um, the presentation was great, and for sharing your knowledge with us. I just want to let everybody out there know that our next parent panel will be on May 5th, and it's going to be on the topic of um, fostering independence in your children. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.